I grew up in a neighborhood in St. Cloud that was virtually all boys. So if you wanted somebody to play with, you better learn how to you know, play basketball or football or baseball. Uh, otherwise, you didn't have anybody to play with. We had a playground a couple of blocks from us in a nice city park very close by. And so I played football and I played baseball and I played basketball. My sister was always playing games in the yard. She'd be playing baseball with neighborhood boys. We'd play family kickball. We had Thanksgiving football games. And so I just thought that sport was something that girls do. It didn't ever occur to me that it was really out of my domain. Up until about fourth grade, I was very happy, had plenty of opportunities because the boys were very accepting and um, I was good enough that they let me play with them. And it was in about fourth and fifth grade when the boys in my class and in my neighborhood got opportunities through Little League and school teams to play. And so there weren't as many opportunities for pickup games. So that's when I really noticed my chances dropped off. I went to the boys tennis coach early on in the season because I knew that was the first step in getting on the team. I asked him and he said, sorry, there's a rule that says that girls can't play on boys teams and if I let you play, the team would be disqualified from interscholastic competition. He said, you can practice when the with the team when there's an odd number, so that's sort of what I was left with. I guess I got used to it because that's the way it had always been, so it was in line with my expectations of what my opportunities were going to be. My sister was a very disciplined player, and while she didn't have friends to hit against at home, she would make a point to go to the tennis courts all the time and hang out at the tennis courts and hit with anyone who showed up who didn't yet have a partner or who might have a little time, and so she had competition and also just a network throughout the city. People recognized her and played with her. But she was quite willing to spend a lot of time just hitting balls against the wall. Um, and then she would bring me sometimes. And for a penny a ball, I would throw her balls and she would hit them across the court. So I was a human ball machine for her. <laughs> Lots of kids now will hang out in the mall when they have free time, but during our summers, boys primarily would hang out at the tennis court. So I played with those guys all the time. It, it was, I didn't have a sense of dismissing me as a competitor. I think that they appreciated that I could play with them. It was no big deal because we had that experience of playing with each other outside of a team. And so I played with them summers and on weekends, and it, we tended to be pretty evenly matched with most of the boys on the team. So. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't an issue as far as they were concerned. My sister Sandy and her now husband Jim are both educators and were aware of the role that the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union had played in um, helping people deal with, in particular, issues of uh, sex discrimination. Um, and they just thought that that might be a place for her to start. But it was kind of an offhanded, casual reference but Peg took it seriously and really recognized that this could be an option and that there was a way to perhaps push past the no and really make a request that would be heard. So she's the one who decided she could write a letter. I sat down and found the address in the phone book and um, wrote a letter to the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union, the local um, affiliate, and just laid out my situation. I, you know, I told them that I wanted to play, that I knew I could compete with the boys, uh, that the coach had turned me down and the athletic uh, director had turned me down and I didn't have any other option. There was no other team uh, to play on and I said, you know, can you help me and P.S. please hurry. I'm a senior because it was my last year in high school. I wanted to let him know how I stacked up against the boys, that I had a sectional ranking. I was ranked number one in my age group at that time for Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and Wisconsin, and that I believed I could play with these guys, and there was really no reason not to let me play except the fact that I was a girl. You know, I think they did a great job of deciding on the cases they were going to take to bring this up because we both played in non-contact sports, 
We were both at schools where there were no other girls' opportunities. There were no cut policies on all of our teams, so it meant that you didn't have to have any skills to play if you were a boy, but no matter what your skills were as a girl, you were ineligible. The Minnesota State High School League wanted to show that girls just could not adequately compete with boys. They argued that uh, basically girls weren't durable enough to play sports, that we weren't fast enough or strong enough or fit enough to do it. One of the coaches, or Tony, the other person in the case, just said, you know, we're talking about norms here, but individually these two girls can compete perfectly fine and there's no reason that they can't step up and play these games. Both Tony and I were there for one day, day to testify about our particular circumstances. State High School League, they contended that this would set girls sports back. I give them this, they wanted to see uh, girls athletic opp opportunities unfold in a way that was very intentional and smooth and having it just burst onto the scene the way it did with this lawsuit uh, probably messed up their long-term plan. They would interview coaches about whether they would be comfortable administering first aid and how would they possibly touch these young girls if there was a need in an emergency. Judge Lorge really wasn't hearing it. He was like, I know how to deal with a Charlie horse and if a player needs to have that, a coach can help them. And if it's more serious, they know how to call it for a nurse. There's no lack of civilization out there on the tennis courts. They argued that having girls play against boys could hurt the boys' emotional and psychological well-being. The very fact that you might put some girls on a boys' team, even though there wasn't a girls' team, would somehow cause the future of girls' sports to implode because all the boys would then think they should join girls' teams, which is a very strange circular argument, but they use that one quite often. Lots of concern about uh, sort of reverse discrimination. If you let girls go on those teams, then what about the boys? And um, they really didn't seem to take into account the absence of girls' teams. You know, this was one of the biggest events in my life. I can't tell you where I was or who told me. I just don't have any recollection of that. There was certainly no press conference, at least that I went to, and there certainly was no uh, rally or, or party. We don't think we celebrated. My family, we, we were good old Norwegian Lutherans, so I'm sure we had a conversation at dinner about what this meant and what would happen next, but it was, that was it. It was just really very, very low-key. I am really am grateful that this happened in a time before social media and Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing, that we only had a couple of networks to deal with in a newspaper and a radio. So it was much more subdued being issued my team warm-up. <laughs> the warm-ups were shared with the boys' swim team, so they were kind of a heavy uh, orange fabric, and they had racing stripes down the sides, and they had a tiger on the back. And I wore that suit to bed for at least the first week that I had it. I just thought that was, I'd made it. I think I probably did more playoffs than were typical among teammates to see if I could make the traveling team to play in a match. There was one guy in the team and I who were pretty even in terms of ability. We went back and forth. Um, so I was slotted to play the third singles, as was he, so we would often have practices where we would play to see who would play in the next match. The first match I played was against a young guy from Coon Rapids, and he was a gentleman, and it was a good match, and he beat me, and he was um, complimentary. I, you know, I can't say enough positive about that match in terms of how, how he behaved. Others, I can tell, were they were going to leave everything on that court before they were going to lose to a girl, and they played their little hearts out. I got to interview one of the players from uh, Apollo High School who Peg played against and beat, and um, he was a very gracious man um, in discussing it, but he also was very aware of how this had been a pretty traumatic event. And 
mainly because while he was quite willing to step up and play peg in this match, his coach chose to let out a kind of taunt to him about that. His, play, his teammates did the same. He was about ready to let that pass, but to hear it from his coach really stung. And the notion that he would somehow belittle him because he lost to a very good player who was a female, he, he wasn't going to take it, and he chose to quit the team. You know, I got some good-natured ribbing, but it was not uh, mean or, you know, evil at all. It was, you know, I played with these guys. They let me, you know, I, they let me play. <laughs> Her teammates surprisingly had very little knowledge of what was going on and didn't really realize the enormity of the case um, or really how difficult it was for a girl to get this opportunity to play. So I was kind of surprised at how out of touch they were with that. But um, one of them just said to me, Sherry, you have to realize we were just kind of teenage boys who didn't pay attention to the news and it was he said I only knew about it because my sister told me and she was the same age as Peg. I played in five matches at number three singles and I won three and I lost two and I earned my high school letter which to this day is one of my fondest athletic memories. The lawsuit, it sort of lit the fire under Title IX. It came just before that happened, and I think it made people realize we're going to be serious about creating opportunities for girls in sports. And so what could have happened at a much slower pace went much quicker because they had the precedent of this lawsuit. So the thing about Title IX is it, it passed in 1972, and, and Peg's case was decided by Judge Miles Lord in 1972. Title IX was really aimed initially at all kinds of educational access and equality for women in everything from scholarships to having instructors and having um, paid positions and making all sorts of opportunities available to women equally in education. And then they realized, oh yeah, and sport is one of those opportunities. But they didn't put into play the specific rules about how it would be implemented for several years. And so Title IX was kind of a soft um, suggestion to a lot of schools for several years. What Peg's case w did was it said, you know, if you don't make a move to at least create a program right now, then girls are going to sue you. I thought it was great, and I thought it was a huge step forward in what had happened with the lawsuit, that now there was really some heft to what would happen in the future with girls and women's, women in sports, and I thought that was great. I was pretty aware of how fast girls' sports were coming into being. It didn't seem fast enough. When I was in high school, there were no girls' teams. The very next year, there were seven different high teams for girls. I played college tennis at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa for four years. Then I came back here to law school, and while I was in law school, the first year I coached, co-coached at uh, Augsburg College, and then I became assistant coach here at the U for the women's team my last two years of law school. It hugely benefited me, because when I entered high school, they were opening up girls' sports one season after another, and all of a sudden I could play a whole array of sports that I really wanted to try. Well, I knew Peg Brendan from when I was 12 years old. She and I got selected to, to play in um, it was a, a youth development um, team here in the Twin Cities, and we would go every Sunday night to the only indoor tennis uh, club at that time, which was in Minnetonka somewhere. So when she was going through that case, I'm not sure that I was even that much aware of it, but I certainly knew about it after um, she won, and it allowed me to play on our, I played on the boys' tennis team in ninth grade and also in 10th grade, and I was able to play on that team because of the ruling that, that she got. As a young girl growing up in St. Cloud, I always had heard about Peggy Brendan, 
as a legend, as a trailblazer, as a pioneer, as a fellow tennis player. And I didn't realize back then the impact that she had on me and our community that I got to play tennis at St. Cloud High School largely because of her. She paved, literally paved the way, paved the court for me to play high school tennis and do what I loved. And as a young girl in high school, I took that for granted. I got to be on the track team and I played softball. Um, my big love was the basketball team and I was on that for three years and got to be captain when I was a senior. It, it hit me really hard for the first time probably 10 years later um, when I was invited back to my high school to speak at a winter pep rally. I hadn't been back to tech since I'd graduated and I didn't leave with a lot of fond memories about the school. I, you know, I kind of left with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, but the athletic director invited me back and so I went and I walked into the gym and there were probably 400, 500 kids in the gym. And the athletic director got up to introduce me and he started by asking all of the girls who played on a sport at Tech, I still get goosebumps when I think about this, to stand up. And all but a handful of girls stood up in the gym. And then he had them sit down. He said, you know, if I'd asked that question when Peg Brendan was a student here, she'd have been the only one standing. And the whole room st stood up and gave me a standing ovation. And that, that brought it home to me. Junior high and early high school girls who are doing history projects for the state history competition, they'll find my name in something they've read or at the Minnesota History Center, and they'll call me or email me and, and ask to interview me. And so in, in that way, it has, had has come up, and it's, it's fun. I definitely see my sister as a role model. She loves the game. She plays sport with a passion, and she plays it with a very dedicated uh, focus to finding her best game. And yet, whenever she plays, she's also very focused on how she can be the best sports person on that court, uh, gracious, um, fair, and not ever letting out any howls of dismay or she will tell her opponent when she's played a good match and she shakes hands and becomes a friend to that person later. I was a workers' compensation judge with the State Office of Administrative Hearings. In the last four or five years that I worked, Tom Wexler had left his job as a district court judge and came over to our office and was doing administrative law work as a, an administrative law judge. And so we did cross paths then and sort of reminisced a bit about the case. And I thanked him again many times over um, for the work that he had done. So when I asked my sister if I could write a, her story, uh, she gave me permission, which was very exciting to me because it's, it's just such um, an amazing story that's so close to me. And so right away, it, I started um, interviewing a whole host of people that were involved. So they were, in some cases, her teammates. In other cases, they were attorneys. Um, in other cases, they were school administrators. Um, I got to interview Judge Miles Lord. So that was a very exciting thing to be able to sort of hear from him firsthand how he considered this case to be one of his proudest moments mm -hmm. and one of the cases for which he actually suggested to the courts that it should be considered one of the most distinguished cases of the U.S. District Court that he was a part of. When I was interviewing Judge Wexler, he explained to me that he was a rookie attorney working on this case pro bono and he had a, a huge federal case which he'd never tried in full before and so he had a lot to do because it was moving really quickly because of the timeline with my sister starting her season that that spring so um, he was trying to put together a brief and he 
had some contact through the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union to realize that the Civil Liberties Union was trying a whole series of cases that dealt with expanding the 14th Amendment and how it applied to women. And so they were very concertedly working to go through cases that would somehow expand and connect the 14th Amendment to women's rights. And he was told that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be someone to talk to, and she gave him a brief to assist so that he could use that at least as a reference point for his own. When you look around us, there is a whole well-developed male domain of sport that women still can't get into when it comes to coaching, when it comes to administrative positions um, and sports writing. And so I think that the nature of sport is bigger than just what we do in high school or play the games that we do in college. It's, it is a whole industry. And women are just starting to crack into that as the commentators and the um, voices that we recognize as professional athletes but there's so much more that needs to come.